Okay, let's use the first and second derivative to sketch a graph of this function f of x. We're going to show all extrema and inflection points along the way. So f of x is a rational function, 6x over x squared plus 4. This certainly isn't a graph that's familiar to everyone, so we're going to use these tools of analysis that we've learned to see if we can figure out where this graph goes on our coordinate plane. First thing we need to do is take the derivative. And you can see this is a quotient, so when we take the derivative, we're going to have the bottom uh, factor, the new denominator, x squared plus 4, times the derivative of the top, which is 6, minus uh, the top one times the derivative of the bottom one, so that's going to be 2x for the derivative, times 6x. And then that's going to have uh, x squared plus 4 squared in the denominator. Now, I'm going to clean that up a little bit. We can distribute the 6 and multiply the like terms, and I think you'll agree that we end up with the first derivative, f, f prime of x, is going to be uh, 24 minus 6x squared over x squared plus 4 quantity squared. And remember, we're looking for critical points here. So basically, we're looking for places where this thing equals 0 or where it's undefined. Now, if I take a look at this denominator, no matter what real number I plug into the denominator, I'm going to get a positive value. Uh, because I'm going to square every number I plug in there and add 4 to it. That's always positive. So I'm never going to have the denominator equals 0, meaning I'm never going to have an undefined value. That tells me that this graph does not have a vertical asymptote. To figure out if the first derivative is going to equal 0, I can set the numerator equal to 0. 24 minus 6x squared. And uh, I think you'll see that a quick little... Uh, bout of algebra will give me two critical points, plus or minus two. Okay, now, because finding the second derivative of this thing is going to be such a hassle, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do a sine diagram on the first derivative and see what's going on. We'll locate our extreme values that way rather than the second derivative test. And I'll do that on the next slide. So I've rewritten my derivative, 24 minus 6x squared over x squared plus 4, quantity squared. I've got my critical points over here, plus or minus 2. Let's do a sine diagram on this thing, and we'll see if we can figure out where these extreme values are, or what kind of extreme values they are. So I'm going to choose some representative points here. I'm going to pick a negative 3, a 0, and a 3. I will plug each of those values into the first derivative. And all I need to know is the sign of the answer. I don't really have to have the exact value. Because we always get a positive number on the bottom in the denominator, regardless of what we plug in, we're really just worried about what's the sign when I plug in a value into the numerator. For example, when I plug negative 3 in for x, I get 6 times 9, which is 54. And 24 minus 54 is like negative 30. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's definitely negative. What that tells me is the function is decreasing on that interval from negative infinity to negative 2. When I plug 0 into this numerator, I get 24 minus 0, which is definitely positive. And that tells me that between negative 2 and 2, my function's increasing. So I've already located a relative min, a local min, uh, at x equals negative 2. I don't know the value yet, but I know it's located there. Plug 3 in here, you get the 54 again, and so that makes a negative. And from 2 to infinity, this thing's going to be negative, meaning this is decrease, or, yeah, decreasing here. And that tells me that I've located a max. Okay? So using the first derivative test, I now know that I have a local minimum at negative 2 and a local maximum at positive 2. If you want to know the 
y values, which we do, we have to plug in those values into f. So I need f of negative 2 and f of positive 2. And uh, going back to the original function, I can tell you that when I plug a 2 in, I get 12 over 8. Uh, 12 over 8 reduces to, what's that, 4 thirds? 3 halves. How about 3 halves or 1.5? That makes more sense. Uh, excuse me, that was the answer for positive 2. 1.5 or 3 over 2. When I plug in a negative 2, you get the negative of that. So it's either negative 1.5 or negative 3 over 2. So I've already located uh, a local max at 2 comma 1.5 and a local min at negative 2 comma negative 1.5. That's a good start. Now we also need to examine if there are any, uh, find out if there are any inflection points in this graph and I also need to check for horizontal asymptotes which we haven't done yet. So we'll use the second derivative to see if we can find some inflection points uh, and the intervals where the functions concave up and concave down. That way we'll know about the shape, we'll check for any horizontal asymptotes, and then we'll draw this graph. To locate the local extreme values, uh, I was able to avoid the second derivative, but in order to find these inflection points, we're going to have to take the second derivative. Don't panic, it is still a quotient, it's just going to have a little extra algebra in it. So let's give myself some room here. We'll do the second derivative. I'm going to need the quotient rule again. So I'll have uh, the bottom term, the v term, if you will, which is x squared plus 4 quantity squared times the derivative of the top term, which is negative 12x minus the top term, 24, the numerator, 24 minus 6x squared times the derivative of this expression on the bottom, which we're going to need the chain rule for. That's going to be times 2 times x squared plus 4 times the derivative of x squared plus 4, which is 2x. Okay, and then all of that is over x squared plus 4 to the fourth. Now, we can do some uh, algebra to clean this up. In fact, we can factor. Notice here I have a factor of x squared plus 4 squared and here I have x squared plus 4. So I can factor one of those out and what that'll end up doing is reducing this by a val by a exponent by, a, by 1. I'll do it in two steps so you can see it. Uh, f double prime of x. I'm factoring out one instance of x squared plus 4 and that leaves x squared plus 4 times negative 12x minus 4x times 24 minus 6x squared. And then remember we have this x squared plus 4 to the fourth. And so you can see doing a little cancellation, this is going to cancel. Oops, I forgot my equal sign. And it's going to reduce this by 1, making it a 3. I can also do some combining of like terms in the numerator. When I distribute this, all right, let's write that out and then we'll use the next slide to clean it up. So I'm going to have negative 12x cubed minus what, 48x. I'm going to distribute this negative 4x and that will give me uh, negative 96x plus 24x cubed. And that whole thing is over x squared plus 4 cubed. All right. We'll finish it up on the next slide. So we left off with this 
expression negative 12x cubed minus 48x minus 96x plus 24x cubed all over x squared plus 4 cubed. And let's just combine some like terms and finish this off. Basically, I'm going to be left with 12x cubed minus 144x over x squared plus 4 cubed. And I can factor out a 12x and make this x squared minus 12 over x squared plus 4 cubed. Now I did that because I'm going to need to find any places where this thing is zero or undefined. Those are candidates for inflection points. And by factoring that numerator, I think you'll agree that it's easy to see that there's a zero here. And then I also have plus or minus the square root of 12. Now there are no undefined values because this, again, is always positive. So basically I have to do a sine diagram on negative square root of 12. 0, square root of 12, and figure out where the concave up and concave down intervals are. If this negative square root of 12 is freaking you out, this is really just negative 2 square root of 3, right? Because 4 times 3 is 12, and this is 2 square root of 3. Okay, so we're going to pick some representative values. I'll go with a negative 1 here. I'll go with a 1 here. Uh, square root of 12 is a little bit over 3, so we'll call it negative 4 and a 4. We're going to test each of those in this second derivative, okay? And the best place to plug them in is to the 12x times x squared minus 12. That's what's going to determine the sign. Remember the bottom, the denominator is always positive. So I'm looking to find out if the answer is going to be positive or negative when I plug negative 4 in here. Uh, when that happens, I get negative 48, and I'm going to get like 16 minus 12, which is positive 4, so that's negative. Negative times a positive and negative, so this is a concave uh, down section of the graph. When I plug negative 1 in here, I get a negative for the negative 12, but over here I get like negative 11, and that's going to be positive. Negative times negative is a positive, so this is a concave up section of the graph. Plug a positive 1 in, I'm going to get positive times negative, which is negative. That's a concave down section of the graph. And then when I plug a 4 in, everything's positive, and I'm going to end up with a positive section, so that's concave up. So now things are starting to take shape. We know our intervals of concavity. We've got inflection points, right, uh, at all three of these, right, at negative 2 squared of 3, at 0, and at 2 squared of 3. Those are, those are inflection points, so all of those are important. Uh, what we haven't checked yet is does this function have any horizontal asymptotes? Before we draw the graph, we've got to find out its end behavior. So I'll do that on this last slide, and then we'll put it all together on a graph. To decide if a function has any horizontal asymptotes or oblique asymptotes, what I need to do is uh, take the limit as x approaches infinity and x approaches negative infinity, right? That's how we check the end behavior. And in this particular function, based on what we've learned, right, when you multiply by 1 over the highest power of x, what we're really doing is we're taking the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of 6 over x over 1 plus 4 over x. And so this limit turns into 0 over 1 plus 0, which is 0. Either way, positive or negative infinity will both get us a 0. So what that tells me is that my function is approaching the x-axis as x gets bigger and bigger. Now, let me show you what that means for the, for the graph. Actually, before I do that, we've got some business to take care of. We said we had inflection points, but we didn't calculate the y values. So we need to do f of negative square root of 12 figure out what that equals. 
f of 0 and f of positive square root of 12. Oops, my colors don't match up, but you see where I'm heading with this. Uh, let's go with f of 0. That's easy. That's just 0 because 0 over 4 is 0. Uh, f of negative square root of 12 is going to be, uh, let's see, negative 6 square root of 12 over 16. I'm just doing a little math here. What's that over 8? Uh, I'm just going to crank this out in the calculator. Hang on. And when I do this, this is approximately negative 1.3. The only thing that changes when I plug in the square root of 12 is that it turns positive. So this is approximately 1.3. We're getting that so we can plug these y values onto our graph. Now let's graph this. We'll put it all together. So here's how this works. First, let's plot those um, maximum and minimum values that we found. We found uh, 2 comma 1.5, which is about right here, and negative 2 comma negative 1.5, which is about right here. Remember, this is a min, this is a max. There was an inflection point at 0, 0, and there was also inflection points at uh, square root of 12, which is, you know, 3 point something, comma 1.3 and negative 1.3. So we're in this range here. Uh, same thing over here. 3 point something, right about there. All right. And we had a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis. So what that tells us is our curve comes through like this. It comes here and then it changes and then it starts heading toward the x-axis. Same thing on this side. It comes down here, concavity changes, and it starts heading towards the x-axis. Remember, we're supposed to sketch this thing. We're not breaking any uh, records for artistry here. But that's the idea that this curve makes. All right? It's a little stretched out on this particular grid, but the point is we located our min, our max, and our inflection points. And then we did a little end behavior to figure out what was happening at each end of this graph. So this is a pretty good sketch. We were not supposed to draw a perfect picture. We needed a sketch with extreme values and inflection points, and that's what we have. Okay, now this took a long time to explain because I had to talk while I was doing it, but as you're working through the problem yourself, uh, it should take probably half as much time. So that's good news. Anyway, keep up the good work. We had a lot of good math in this problem, and you just need to keep um, studying up on the first and second derivative test. Good luck.